So when you think about existing molecules, i.e. molecules that are either FDA approved or, you know, like 17 uh, alpha estradiol is not an FDA approved molecule, but it's been tested and it's had unbelievable success in male mice in the um, ITP. When you think about canagaflozin, acarbose, of course, rapamycin, metformin, um, what molecule do you think of the molecules we know about today has the most potential for gyro protection? Certainly, if we go by the mouse data, it would have to be rapamycin. Um, if we go by the human data, it would have to be metformin. Both of those are weak statement. You know, my qualifications for each of those is a pretty major qualifications. I actually think that what might turn out to be the most helpful is combinations of these things. So rapamycin plus metformin. Um, the, what, I, what I like about metformin is that the most compelling data come from human studies, not from mouse studies. Mm -hmm. The mouse data on metformin are weak. Yeah, it didn't succeed in the ITP, which is, were you surprised no. by that? No, no, I wasn't surprised by that at all. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't work out in humans. It's because just because most clinical trials don't. I mean, the existing data, which is voluminous and all pretty much points in one direction, which is, is that it's, it's going to be uh, beneficial. Again, it all comes from people that are d taking metformin because they're diabetic. And so this could be a lot like the Wisconsin experiment again, where it's not going to work if you do it on people who are healthy. Right. Now, Nier would I mean, argue don't against that, right? Nier would say that there were many benefits that, that, you know, we see in metformin that go far beyond its uh, glucose regulatory benefits that are the obvious benefit that the diabetic patients get. Yeah, no, no, Nier would be quite emphatic about disagreeing with me on this. Um, I, I'd love to be wrong about that, but I just, if I had to put my money, it's just because most clinical trials fail. And most clinical trials fail because they were based on mouse data to start off with, at least. So maybe this is, maybe this is something, do. it's certainly worth figuring out just because the effects are so manifold. You know, it's, it's, it's dementia and cancer and heart disease, and we don't know what else. Uh, we don't know, for instance, what it might do to muscle function. The, you know, the best data on that, it's not good for muscle function. But again, that comes from uh, early work, and I think we have a, a, a long ways to go. Because it's so safe, mm -hmm. you know, that's the, that's the big thing about metformin is that we know it's extremely safe. It's been taken by millions of people. We don't know that about rapamycin yet. Um, but I think it ought to be a high priority to find out what low-dose rapamycin does. Um, the trouble is, it, you know, giving drugs of any sort to completely healthy people is something that the FDA is not going to go for. So we're almost going to have to work these things out on people that have some sort of illnesses to start off with. How would you dose rapamycin in a longevity trial, just as a thought experiment, given two pieces of evidence that seem um, to be at dialectical odds with each other? So they are as follows. In the mice studies, in all of the ITP studies, the animals were fed rapamycin in their chow meant, meaning they received rapamycin every day. They were always eating rapamycin. But based on our mechanistic understanding of rapamycin, we believe that the benefits come not from global inhibition of mTOR, but from the inhibition of mTOR complex one and not the inhibition of mTOR complex two. And in fact, the inhibition of mTOR, mTOR complex two might actually have some negative consequences. And if you were to take constitutively rapamycin, as patients do with organ transplants, you were suppressing both. How do you reconcile those two? And how would you design a clinical trial to address this if your stated purpose was increasing longevity? Well, I, I, the first thing I would do is I would start off with a dose that's been already been tested in human for its uh, effects in enhancing uh, vaccine response to influenza because they did multiple doses. That's now that right. wasn't rapamycin, no, that, that was, was a rapa, rapalog. Yeah. And that yeah, was, right. five, so five milligrams of everolimus 
and 20 milligrams of everolimus given once a week did just that. Right. And the lower dose had, was just as effective at boosting immune response as the higher dose and had fewer side effects. So I would start off with that episodically yep. like they did mm -hmm. because I think there's some evidence that, that you're getting just as big a boost from Without that. the side effects. Without the side effects. And also I think, you know, there, you can imagine how much the drug companies are working to find a wrap up log that doesn't inhibit complex two. I mean, that's gonna be huge if they can come up with something that works really differentially on complex one. That's really where I would start it. I think those vaccine studies were uh, a, a great start. And if they would, cause they were, uh, those were healthy people, right? They just were older people. Right. They were people, I think 65 and older. Um, I would like to see those things um, continued. Now, it's interesting, a number of years ago, we tried to get funding for what I thought was uh, a really good rapamycin study, but we were unsuccessful, which is that there was a NIH clinical trial to look at rapamycin as preventative for the reoccurrence of kidney cancer. So this is people that already had a kidney removed, but were seemingly cured, but they have a higher than average, you know, rate of relapse. They were giving one year of rapamycin to see if it reduced that. And I said, wait a second, why don't we jump in and measure inflammation, muscle strength, you name it, all these things in this experiment that was already ongoing. Uh, but unfortunately that didn't get funded. But on the other hand, it may have been too high a dose because this is a therapeutic dose for right. immunosuppressive purposes, right? So it may not have been the right dose anyway. Yeah. So we might've come to a conclusion that was misleading. I thought that that uh, a vaccination study was a great avenue for starting a longer term study. And, uh, and I know they're, they're doing some of that in uh, a private company, you know, spin off from. Yeah. Are you excited about the SGLT2 inhibitors? I think, I think it's a little early to tell. I'm, I, I, you know, um, that and the, the NAD, uh, you know, various NAD precursors, I, I just, I think it's a little too early. I typically, you know, this is, so scientists are often by temperament and training, extremely skeptical. And, 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 you know, I think that's why we make boring interviews so often is they want, we don't want to ever come down on a, and, and make a clean statement, but I really need to see the data before I start to get excited. And, 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 and I never get excited by a single mouse study. Mm -hmm. um, I get intrigued, but I don't get, excited. Although the human data on the SGLT2 inhibitors is also remarkable. I mean, I think that's, yeah. you know, that's the sort of, that's the theme here, right? Is you have a great ITP outcome. And of course the human data are not for longevity, but they're, right. again, they suffer the, the limitations of all human studies, namely that they're being used in a subset of the population that might not be the subset of interest, but you know, the impact on kidney failure uh, all-cause mortality, heart failure uh, is, is pretty impressive. Um, and I think what's interesting about what the ITPs show us with both canagliflozin and acarbose is that the benefits might not have to do anything with reducing, you know, caloric intake, right? Which was the proposed right. reason for, for acarbose, but rather has to do with glucose kinetics. And I find that very fascinating, actually. I do too, and I, and I have to say I'm I'm disappointed in the ITP that they dropped their parafed arm of that. When they started off, there was going to be a parafed arm, mm. and they dropped that. And I'm a bit disappointed because you we don't know now. We only have body weight. We don't have food consumption, so we don't know how much of these effects might be due to food consumption, and how many might not be. Um, or changes in the temporal pattern of food consumption. You know, maybe if it makes your stomach feel a little bit queasy, you don't want to eat again for 20 hours. Mm -hmm. But um, so the human data, are, I mean, we're going to make real progress when we have human biomarkers. Yeah. And we can do, we can do a five year study and we can say, we know this is going to uh, decrease 
dementia, heart disease, cancer, preserve muscle strength, uh, boost immune response, not just immune system, because we have to be careful of that. I think people think, oh yeah, we want to boost the immune system. Well, we don't want autoimmune diseases. We don't want our immune system to go haywire uh, because it mischaracterized something as, as an invasion. But we want to boost immune responsiveness, certainly. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the limiting factor right now is biomarkers. Thank you.